the Eurozone crisis. Does Europe need a new financial structure? In the interview, European Central Bank Executive Board Member Jörg Asmussen. Mr. Asmussen, you're a member of the ECB Executive Board, considered one of the world's most influential financial posts. Is that assessment correct? One should refrain from overestimating or underestimating their importance. It's a very responsible position, but I harbor no illusions of grandeur. But you have the power to influence policy. Does it live up to your expectations? We are the world's second largest central bank, so of course we can influence policy, especially in this difficult economic phase for Europe. On the other hand, there are negatives. In a position like mine, you have to weigh very carefully each and every word you utter. That's tough for me. <laughs> in last week's German elections, an upstart Eurosceptic party received almost 5% of the votes. It favours disbanding the Eurozone and leaving the single currency. How do you explain the phenomenon? First of all, the ECB is completely neutral politically, but we are intensely involved in defending the euro's stability and preserving it. We believe that it is a stable and secure currency serving 330 million people. Of course, there are doubters. Several Eurozone nations have fallen on hard times. But it's a fact that the euro did not cause those problems. The source was simply bad fiscal management and a loss of competitiveness. But the euro did not spawn crisis among most of these nations. Do you sense a growing euro skepticism in Germany? I travel through Germany a lot, trying to better explain the ECB and what it does. Of course, I hear criticism, but there is also a vast amount of support. I think that as people realize what we do and why we're doing it, they'll see that the alternatives touted as better aren't really. We're building trust in the euro, but we're also convincing people about European integration as a whole. Massive numbers are thrown around in relation to the euro crisis. Some say it will cost two trillion euros. Does this cause you sleepless nights? My young daughters are the only thing that give me sleepless nights, but managing a currency for 17 countries is certainly a major responsibility. Soon it will be 18. Latvia will join the euro on January 1st. So we must redouble our efforts to provide a stable currency for the entire eurozone. Which countries are you most worried about? How do you assess the situation in Greece, for example? A lot has transpired in Greece over the past few years. Despite the opinions in a lot of countries, Athens has made great and very difficult strides towards adjusting. It has made substantial progress in consolidating its budget. But Greece still faces major difficulties. Youth unemployment stands at 60 percent. But there's still more to do. The message is clear. Athens has made good progress. I say that with the utmost respect. They are laying the groundwork for economic growth and job creation. And that will allow Greece to finance structural reforms that will further boost the economy. But you can't put stimulus programs into place with an austerity budget. It's a strategy with two cornerstones. Greece must put its fiscal house in order. In actual fact, the country was bankrupt. And the austerity measures have certainly had a negative impact on growth. But on the other hand, measures have to be put into place to spur economic growth. Structural reform that stimulates the economy, for instance, supporting ailing professional services. You travel to Greece a great deal. What's the mood like? It depends on who you talk with. But the present government is pressing ahead with its austerity budget. It's a course the Greek government chose for itself. They didn't do it on behalf of the Troika or to please the female leader of a foreign government. We fully support this program. A lot of non-governmental institutions have been hit hard and young people as well. So there is tension, especially due to high unemployment. It's depressing and fully unacceptable. 
natürlich bedrückend ist und auch nicht akzeptabel ist. Hm. Sein drittes Will Greece need a third bailout package? It's too early to say. The current program runs until the end of 2014. After that, we'll have to see whether Greece is ready to go it alone. We'll try to make that determination by the end of the second quarter next year. If Greece can't stand alone, the other Eurogroup nations have promised to provide aid beyond the expiration of the current package. So when will the decision be made on further aid for Greece? We won't be able to make a final decision on a third aid package before the summer or fall of next year. It depends on how far along Greece is in terms of returning to the capital markets. Slovenia is the newest problem child. What's your assessment? The situation in Slovenia is particularly difficult. Audits are currently underway of the country's ten biggest banks. The ECB is involved, as is the European Commission. The results are due by the end of November or early December. Then we'll know how much capital the Slovenian banks need and whether the government is capable of taking care of the problem on its own or whether external aid is needed. The ECB also wants to take responsibility for regulating the European banking sector as a whole. Why is that so important? In the past, individual countries have been responsible for regulating their banking sectors. But many major banks operate throughout the entire EU. For me, that's one of the major lessons of the 2007 banking crisis. The central bank must have the power to oversee day-to-day -day operations at major lending institutions. That's why we need a European banking union. That would put 130 major European banks under ECB jurisdiction. What does that mean in economic terms? That's right, 130 banks under ECB jurisdiction. That will cover 85% of the Eurozone banking sector. Is it feasible that the ECB would allow banks to go bankrupt? Is that possible? The regulatory mechanism must be able to tell the ECB whether a bank remains viable or not. If not, the bank will be handed over to an agency responsible for liquidation. That agency still has to be created. But that will be a vital element of the banking union. We must have an agency that can liquidate banks without causing major shockwaves in the financial sector. Many countries don't want the ECB making those kinds of decisions. They want to make their own decisions. I think that decisions regarding the future of those 130 banks should be made at a European level. Heads of state and government have decided that the power should be put in the hands of the ECB. Which European bureaucracy takes on the responsibility is of secondary importance. But we need Europe-wide decision-making, because these 130 banks operate throughout Europe. Will all 130 banks survive? It's too early to tell because nobody is in charge yet. We'll only be given the authority 12 months after the final banking union legislation has become law. Unfortunately, additional unnecessary delays cropped up this past week. The Council of Ministers bowed to British pressure and put off a final decision. It's regrettable, but it appears we won't be able to start until the fall of next year. Why is implementation so difficult and why is there so much resistance? There's always support for the status quo, but I believe we must learn our lessons from the financial crisis. That is, we need an oversight mechanism and the possibility of liquidating major European banking institutions. We saw that firsthand here in Germany with Hupo Real Estate, when its Irish affiliate got into big trouble. We saw similar problems with Dexia and Fortis. All these banks are operating multinationally. It simply isn't enough to let individual countries regulate and liquidate these institutions, because many of them operate throughout Europe and even on a global scale. Some complain that the ECB is becoming too powerful. 
Now another thousand employees will be added with the banking union. What's your response? I think in the end, man must first say. We're not doing it on our own. We're simply taking on the tasks handed to us through European policy and the elected officials of the individual EU countries. It's important to differentiate between monetary policy and banking oversight. At an organizational level, there must be a clear distinction both organizationally and in terms of personnel. Many central banks are in charge of both monetary policy and banking regulation. The U.S. Federal Reserve and Germany's Bundesbank are two examples. But we need clear democratic and parliamentary oversight of the future European banking regulators. ECB monetary policy is independent for good reason. Banking oversight is not. We've struck an agreement with the European Parliament that will exert control over this future function of the ECB. Wie man diesen Bereich der EZB Tätigkeit in Zukunft kontrolliert. What happens if the ECB recommends liquidation and the controllers say no? Theoretically, an attempt would be made to reorganize and restructure the bank. That's one possibility. The liquidation agency would make a final decision on how to deal with the bank. Mr. Rasmussen, you were a politician before you went to the ECB. Are you considering a return to politics? I wasn't a politician, I was a revenue officer. Now I'm a European public servant and I'm happy with that. Your name is being circulated as a possible finance minister in Germany's new government. My ECB contract runs through 2019 and I intend to fulfill it. Jörg Asmussen, thank you.